Hey, what's up guys, I'm Matt with The Movement System. In this video, we're gonna talk about eccentric overload training. We're gonna talk about the physiology of eccentric overload training, and then if this is a good strategy for athletes to train, and when they might use it. And the answer may surprise you. So let's go ahead and dive into it. All right, so let's start off by talking about what eccentric overload actually is. So when we're doing an eccentric contraction, the force that the muscle is providing is less than the force that the resistance is providing. So in this example of a bicep, we're gonna have greater force from the resistance, whether that be gravity or the machine, that resistance is gonna be pulling the muscle with more force than the muscle can provide back. And that's gonna cause a lengthening while contracting. So at a muscle physiology level, this is what's going on. You may remember that at a microscopic level, the muscle is contracting by causing this actin myosin interaction and then shortening the myosin heads and causing the muscle to shorten. Well, whenever the muscle is actually lengthening, we can actually get more damage to those myosin heads because as the muscle is lengthening under load, those myosin heads are trying to shorten, but instead they're getting pulled away and they might actually shear and cause more muscle damage. So from a muscle physiology perspective, we might have more damage to the myosin heads, which would require more muscle protein synthesis, and in theory, stimulate more hypertrophy under the right conditions. So all exercises have some combination of concentric movement when we're shortening the muscles, eccentric movement when we're lengthening the muscles, and even some isometrics worked in there. So this process is pretty normal where we're gonna be damaging the myosin heads, causing some damage to other muscle proteins like titan and actin, and we're gonna stimulate muscle protein synthesis this way. But by specifically targeting the eccentric component of exercise and overloading that portion of the movement, we may be causing extra damage to these myosin heads and in theory stimulating more muscle protein synthesis. Now importantly, this is not done by just slowing down the eccentric portion of the exercise. We actually have to increase the load during the eccentric portion of the exercise to where it's greater than the load during the concentric portion of the exercise. I mean, if we just do a slow eccentric on a bicep curl, we're not really overloading the eccentric. We're just doing the eccentric slow. So that process of just slowing down the eccentric could be considered eccentric accentuated training, but eccentric overload training is where we're actually loading the eccentric to a greater extent than we're loading the concentric. And this actually does make sense because the muscle is stronger for an eccentric contraction. Thinking about that bicep curl, you can hold and lower slowly a lot more weight than you can curl up. So if you can curl up, say 50 pounds, you can actually probably curl on a slow eccentric, maybe 70 or 80 pounds with good control. And if we're doing it that way, where we're actually lowering more weight than we could actually curl up, that would be eccentric overload training. Some other examples of eccentric overload would be something like a Nordic hamstring curl. And this is actually a really good exercise that has a lot of applicability to the rehab process because we get a peak contraction of that hamstring musculature, similar to the sprinting phase, the swing phase of running, where we're kicking the leg out and having to slow that hamstring down with a heavy, hard, eccentric contraction. So when we're doing that Nordic hamstring curl, you can see that we're slowly loading that eccentric motion of the hamstring muscle. So the muscle is trying to contract into knee flexion, but the gravity is pulling you into an extension force that's greater than the flexion force that we can provide. And at some point you'll kind of break and uh, fall unless you're really, really strong doing these Nordic hamstring curls. So this would be an example of providing more force during the eccentric phase than you could during the concentric phase. Another example of this would be whenever you're doing a machine and you're using two legs, for example, on a leg extension to kick the machine out, and then you're lowering slowly with one leg. So in this example, we're using two legs for the concentric to extend the knees, and then we're doing the eccentric portion with one leg. And that's gonna basically double the load of the eccentric portion on the quadricep muscle. And this is another good example of doing eccentric overload for the quadricep muscle, the patellar tendon, which could potentially stimulate tendon healing or more hypertrophy of the quadriceps this way. So, so far we've kind of painted a pretty good picture of eccentric overloads, but there's actually some cases where eccentric overload is not a good idea for athletes. And to understand this, we have to think about the principle of specificity. The principle of specificity basically says that whatever we train, we're gonna get better at. So if we train the quadriceps, we're gonna get stronger quadriceps. If we train the biceps, we're gonna get stronger biceps. And this is also specific to the phases of muscle contraction. So if we train isometric contractions, we're gonna get better at isometric contractions. If we train eccentric contractions, we're gonna get stronger with eccentric contractions. But training eccentric contractions 
does not necessarily mean that we're going to improve our power for concentric muscular contractions. So for athletes who are trying to maximize concentric explosive power, we can't just be training eccentrics. The reason for this is that we actually need to train the neurophysiological response of quickly contracting a muscle concentrically. The specificity of training that is going to actually improve that quality. If we think about jumping or bounding or power skips or like a lot of sport movements that are explosive and plyometric, there's going to be some eccentric component which is going to be fairly quick and very heavy load followed by a quick amortization phase where we're transitioning from eccentric to concentric and then that quick concentric phase where we're actually exploding through that movement. So training the eccentric is going to improve part of these athletic movements, but we also need to train those quick transitions out of the hole as well as those explosive concentric jumps up. And this is where I have a problem with companies who want to say, oh, we need to replace all of our training with eccentric overload training and do all of our training with flywheels and these eccentric overload machines. So while those can play a part in training, specifically in the hypertrophy phase of training, or if we're trying to improve deceleration mechanics, or if we're in a phase of training where athletes can be sore and overloaded and that's okay, then that makes sense. But there are also phases of training like the late preseason and in-season training phases where we probably should not do too much on the eccentric side and really focus on concentric explosive movements. So overall, eccentric training is like most things. There's a place for it, and there's a good use case for eccentric overload, but it doesn't fit every athlete in all cases. We actually have to consider sport specificity and program design according to that principle. Hopefully this information is helpful for you to design your athlete's programs. If it was, go ahead and smash that like button, subscribe so you don't miss any future videos, and I'll catch you guys in the next one. Thanks.